Hello and welcome to Yats, another video. And in this video, I would like to talk about this camera right here. It's the Sony A7, and this is the original A7 line of cameras. And to be honest, back when it first came out, I didn't really like it a lot, even though I still agree with myself at that time. But now, because I've been looking at this camera from a completely different angle and also using this camera from a different perspective than what I would use this camera for back then. I really am pleased to tell you that I really enjoy using this camera the past few months and to be honest with the price being so low nowadays I would actually still highly recommend this camera and yeah in this video I would like to actually share with you my opinions on the pros and cons what I think about this camera and why I still recommend to a lot of people so without further ado let's get into the video. the Sony a7 now this camera came out quite a long time ago as I mentioned earlier it was way back in 2013 I believe and around that time I was still using the uh, 5d line of cameras like the 5d mark threes 5d mark twos and I was also using the 7d line of cameras the 70d and on the Nikon side I believe it was around like the d7000 or something like that and um, yeah just like any other professional photographers when this camera first came out it was very interesting to actually read about it and see sample pictures see the performance of it but there weren't a lot of compelling reason to really change to this system because the lenses weren't really there the autofocusing system were very uh, slow sluggish and also inaccurate and yeah the image quality didn't really outweigh all the other competing cameras of course this camera wasn't the first full-frame camera from Sony I mean they have the a900 from the DSLR side of things but it was really their first first real mirrorless full-frame camera that they're saying like okay we're really committing to this and we're releasing this and we'll just develop it from there because you can really see how they pretty much capped most of the design language onto the more modern Sony cameras as well. It looks very similar to the a7 IV that's filming me right now in fact because like looking at the skull, the signature, the buttons, a lot of things are pretty much in roughly the same place just with minor tweaks to just improve the ergonomics, the operational side of things of course. And speaking of that I would actually like to lead into this video which I'll be dividing into three different sections. So the first one is the operational side of things the ergonomics the usability and then leading into the image quality which will be about the photography and the filmmaking well video side of things as well although more into photography than video and then just into my conclusion why I still like using this camera and why I still recommend though not for everyone but still for a lot of people so let's first dive into the ergonomic side of things the usability the yeah the operational side of things of this camera well this camera even though it came out quite a long time ago I personally still like the feeling of this camera it's very nice and compact and also quite light though just like anyone will actually talk about the grip could actually be a bit bigger uh, because if you actually mount some lenses like this one which is not even that big it's the uh, 14 to 24 f 2.8 from Sigma art lens it does feel a little bit front heavy because yeah the grip is not really there rather than because it's actually really heavy uh, the lens is actually not that heavy it's just yeah how the grip is designed that it's a bit wider here but not really something to um, counterbalance the finger here so yeah but that's a really minor thing especially if you're using a lot of you know adapted vintage lens like from Leica from Canon from Nikon from other older manufacturers as well like Pentax so yeah a lot of people who are buying this camera today are actually buying it because they want to experiment and adapt older vintage lenses on here as well so if you're only adapting those lenses then I think the grip is actually quite nice and doable so yeah on to the side though here's only one memory card which can put a lot of people off to be honest it didn't really put me off by any means but the only thing that got me kind of worried is um, despite having weather sealing in this camera but around the ports and and also different doors they don't have any rubber gaskets like the cameras it was kind of competing at the time on the DSLRs because a lot of DSLRs at the time in the same range would have rubberized gaskets on their doors for their uh, weather sealing and also either using rubberized gaskets on this side of the ports or using a rubber flap 
just to cover the ports so that the water, dust, sand doesn't really get in that easily. Now on this camera, I would imagine that you still can take into like light rain and also light heat, wave, light um, sandy places, but I wouldn't really re recommend it, you know, taking it through like, let's say harsh conditions, let's say downpour or super hot condition like the desert, things like that. I'm sure that there were many photographers who have took this camera through those places, through those unforgiving conditions, but in general, because of how skeptical I am with the ceiling on this camera, I wouldn't really recommend that. So yeah, moving on to the next point, which is the screen. The screen itself is actually quite nice. It's still, you know, you're still able to really judge your exposure, your colors and everything quite nicely on the screen. It will still be quite accurate. The viewfinder is also quite nice and smooth. I quite like the viewfinder considering its age. It's also quite detailed. Of course, it's not going to be really something to compete with the a7 IV that's filming me right now, uh, but you know, it will still get its job done. So that's quite nice. The only downside about this electronic viewfinder is probably when you're using it in the dark, it can be very laggy. And if you're like shooting at event photography or low light wedding photography, let's say after the actual um, ceremony at the church, you're going for dinner and it's set in a really dark room in a hotel room or something like that, or just outdoor in the evening, it can feel very scary to look through the viewfinder simply because it is very slow and it's ghosting here and there everywhere, but I can assure that the actual image isn't really that bad. It's just that the sensor transmitting the information to the viewfinder isn't really, you know, all that good uh, compared to the more modern cameras that can actually transfer it more clean and will actually be more in real time. So just keep that in mind. But otherwise, in normal lighting condition, it is a very nice and detailed viewfinder and one that I think you will quite enjoy using it considering it is an old camera. So yeah. And another point is actually the ports here. I find them actually quite nicely organized. So rather than opening all of the ports at once, you only have to open the ports that are really nicely categorized. Like up here, you have your audio kind of port. So you can monitor your audio by putting your headphone in and you can also record your audio uh, by putting your or plugging in your microphone up here. So that's actually quite nice and it's also color coded. So that's even better. And down here is just pretty much your output ports. And uh, yeah, what I really don't like about it, it's the micro HDMI. A lot of people also don't really like it. But anyway, moving on to the next point, which is the battery. The battery life on here is actually not bad. Um, it's not as bad as, let's say, using the same battery on the A7R2 or even on the A7R because those cameras really shoot up these, this battery quite badly. But on this camera, this battery, personally, for what I shoot it for, is actually quite nice. I can go a couple of days doing some simple street photography, some simple cityscapes photography, or just like anything that's simple and not really requiring a lot, let's say, intensive portrait shoot or something like that. Because if you're doing something really intensive like that, the battery life will actually drain quite quickly and you might need to carry around three or four extra batteries, but these batteries are actually going much cheaper nowadays and it's also quite small. So don't need to mind having them in your camera bag. That said, it is annoying if the battery will go out in the middle of an event shoot or something and you could potentially be missing that uh, event that you're, or moment in that event that you're actually trying to capture. So yeah, if you're not really using it intensively, it's a really nice battery, but if you're using it intensively, consider getting other batteries as well, like at least three or four. I'm not exaggerating on that that's the bare minimum you should have. And another point I would like to actually talk about is the shutter. So the shutter sound on this camera is actually quite loud. So if you're hoping to get this camera because it's mirrorless and it could be actually silent, well, it's actually very loud. Actually listen to this. Um, yeah, that's one shot. That's two shot. It sounds like taking two pictures, but it's actually two different shots. So here, this again. And uh, yeah, if you're hoping to, you know, photo shoot in like quiet environment and being still, well, this camera doesn't really cut it. And also the shutter actually 
is very harsh that it vibrates the camera a little bit. So usually I am able to get very steady shots at 30th of a second, but on this camera, I would have to say around 40th of a second. That's how bad uh, this camera is. But then again, it's really only subjective to me how I handle cameras. But usually, yeah, on even the 1DX, which is a brick of a camera and the shutter flaps really hard, I am still able to get steady shots at 25th of a second. So it should say something about this body having very harsh uh, shutter curtain. So yeah, in case you're you know going to be shooting outside, let's say in low light, have very steady hands. Or using lenses with some sort of image stabilization is going to be very handy. <laughs> So yeah, so we're moving on to the next point, which is the button layout, how it operates and how it just feels when in use. So I'm really happy to actually inform all of you that the buttons on here are really nicely arranged. I really like how it feels. I really like how it just responds when you're actually shooting in different kind of conditions, whether in cold environments or in super hot environment or just, you know, when you're covered with like gloves, it actually still operates quite nicely. And despite being a very small design, um, your grip or your palm doesn't really kind of cover a lot of well press by accident on a lot of these buttons even though it kind of covers them but the downside that i really don't like is the lack of a dedicated iso button of course you can ask like but david you can actually assign some of the customized buttons to actually be a dedicated iso button of course you can but with the, with the fact that there's no joystick here also means that i'm using most of the customized button just for the af kind of settings so hitting one customized button button will already change the mode of AF and hitting the other uh, customized button is already like changing the location of the AF points. So yeah, you can kind of already see my problem. So I just wish that there would be a dedicated ISO button on here. It would really change my frustration on this layout a lot but otherwise i really love the rest of the layout it's quite logically arranged i also like the fact that this is actually metal dial because on my a7 IV, which is filming me right now the dial at the back here is actually plastic and i broke that within two weeks of having this camera and i bought the a7 IV new and yeah two weeks after buying it and the knob already broke it was already like a huge blow to me because it was a very expensive camera but you know having a metal one here i wish that sony would continue with their uh, build quality on having metal dials on future products because if i can break it within two weeks of course by accident and that was only like less than 10 centimeter drop uh, onto my macbook um then i'm sure many other photographers who are using it in or, or who will be using it in really harsh environment let's say wildlife photography having multiple cameras banging each other you know because as they are trying to capture other birds other wildlife things like that you know i really feel sorry for the button build quality well, the dial build quality for future a7 IV users who are going to be using it intensively. But anyway, back to this camera. Yeah, it's really nicely built and also the on-off button despite being up here, unlike Fuji cameras, I don't find it to be an easily accidental knock. It's a very sturdy um, on and off and also it doesn't protrude too much out that it'll be accidental switch and not to mention there's a grip here kind of blocking it anyway, so that is good. And yeah, that's pretty much it for the button layout, how it operates, the external designs, things like that. And now on to the performance of the camera and the software. Well, as you heard from many of the Sony users, as well as many other people who tried Sony cameras in the past, saying how bad uh, the design of the Sony cameras are, well, the design of the menu system and everything. And I can confirm with that because it is really that bad. It's super inefficient. The naming is completely different. Well, not completely, but like in a lot of cases, it's very different from how other manufacturers would actually name certain settings so like beep uh, on a Canon uh, would be something like audio signal on the uh, Sony but obviously if you're coming from brands like Canon and Nikon something like audio signal would really refer to the level of audio that is recorded but no it's referring to the AF beep on this camera so yeah and it is still like this even on my a7 IV so yeah it seems like Sony is really having a lot of confidence with the way they're actually naming their menu settings things like that how it really got a lot of photography confused in the first place but you can get used to it and once you're used to it 
You will still find it quite hard to navigate through the menu efficiently, though you still can navigate through. But if you manage to set everything to the way that you want out in the field, then it's gonna be okay. You don't really need to access your menu that often anyway. So yeah, it really depends on what you do with it. And on the performance side of things, this camera is able to capture up to like around five frames per second. Though if you're using it for continuous tracking, it can really achieve between two to three frames per second. And and mind you, most of those frames will not really be properly in focus. So really be careful of what you're actually shooting. For something like minor portrait shoots, like if your subject is moving ever so slightly, then okay, the tracking will work. But for something like sports, let's say if you're photographing baseball or if you're just photographing gymnastics, things like that, the AF will not really keep up with any of those kind of tracking. So just be aware of that. And it's not really a matter of lenses, like which lenses you use. Of course, it will only increase the accuracy or the speed by just a hair but the sensor is still not really capable to really track subject that quickly so just really keep that in mind and if you're actually coming from let's say the more modern Sony cameras it doesn't have this real-time kind of uh, tracking where you just have this square in the middle you put it on the subject and it starts tracking that subject it doesn't have that and it's nowhere near as advanced as that so just keep that in mind but on another hand this camera is really good at focusing in low light not really fast but really accurate so if you're into like night cityscape or just photographing uh, sceneries places at night this camera can actually capture well can actually focus on those scenes very accurately just even in the first go but just make sure you're actually using lenses that are actually quite bright like for example this um, Sigma f 2.8 it's the uh, 14 to 24 this will definitely be a huge help compared to like if you were to use an f4 lens of course you will still be able to stop down to like f14 or f9 or what have you but having a bright aperture to help the camera focus on the scenery in the first place really makes a huge difference and this camera will focus on night sceneries, night places, night cityscapes really accurately and I've been enjoying using this camera for nightscapes photography so yeah it's it's quite nice. And now one last point before I'll move into the image quality side of things and that is this strap hooks thingy here and I don't know the proper name for it but if you're using the more modern Sony cameras, you'll know that they've made it, well, they've made the hole a bit tighter, that these things don't um, jump around anymore. But on this camera, it can be very fiddly, very annoying. Of course, I'm planning to take it off, but I never really got time to, or I've been just too lazy. But if you do have it, I really highly recommend you take this off because it's really, really annoying. And I just wish that they would actually came up with this idea from the very beginning, like the a7 IV uh, that has a much um, thicker, well, less smaller hole inside so that this thing doesn't move around as much and just pretty much locks it in place. So yeah. And now moving on to the image quality. Well, the image quality on this camera is nothing new, but it's still quite nice for even modern day standards. Of course, the dynamic range is not really there up to like the more modern camera, but it's not really far behind either. It's still a very good camera when it comes to, you know, the dynamic range, the rendition in certain condition. Of course, from different color tones it does very good at rendering from different color tones but what it's not really good at rendering is from highlights to shadow despite having good enough dynamic range but rendering from highlights to shadow can prove a little bit hard for this sensor but if you're just shooting for like normal scenarios you wouldn't really see that much of a difference but you know if you're doing like a lot of extreme landscapes you will be seeing that huge difference for sure and another point is the sensor is also really good in low light so if you're using an ISO 3200 I would still say that it's still pretty much clean enough for most situation or for general use but if you go higher than that prepare for some grains now of course it really depends on how you're going to be using the images because if you're only going to be posting them up on social media accounts and or printing them up to A4, A3, or even A2 size of image. The resolution on here being very high at 24 megapixels, you can still uh, trade in some of the resolution and just 
denoise the image a little bit so that the image becomes a bit cleaner. So you can actually use a little bit higher ISO. But of course, even if you use higher ISO, it really helps if you are also using brighter lenses because if you're using really dark lenses, and of course with the high ISO, it really brings out a lot of noise. Uh, so just keep that a little bit in mind. On the other hand, I also enjoy the fact that this camera doesn't really show a lot of moiré and aliasing because it, with cameras from this age, a lot of full frame cameras still show a lot of moiré and aliasing. So if you take a look at the uh, D600, that sensor, even though it's 24 as well, it actually shows much more moiré and aliasing than this sensor. So it's really nice to have such a sensor uh, from this camera producing really fine images without, well, I wouldn't say without, just very little amount of moiré and aliasing while well, it's able to really prevent a lot of those to begin with. And yeah, seeing it at this price point nowadays is really something special because even more modern cameras will still struggle with moiré and aliasing at some point, but this camera just handles it really well. But now onto somewhat downside of this camera in terms of image quality is the color science. Yes, a lot of photographers really complained about it and it's true, the color science on this camera isn't really that good. It's kind of very faded and fuzzy somehow. It's not fuzzy in terms of the fact that it's not sharp. It is sharp, but I don't know. It's just not really clear and you really have to bring life into it in editing. And also if you're photographing a lot of, let's say, portraits where you really have to deal with different skin tones, things like that, this camera will also struggle with skin tone because it will add some sort of yellow, some sort of magenta, depending on the color tones you actually, what well, color skin tones you're actually working with. It's not as bad as earlier Panasonic cameras, but it's also not much better either. So just keep that in mind if you're actually using this camera to photograph portraits. But otherwise, this camera is still a very nice camera with a very capable sensor inside. So if you're actually willing to spend a bit of time editing later in post, you will be able to come out with a lot of nice, good results with this camera. And that is something that I really love about using this camera is because, you know, the sensor is still great despite the age and also for the price you can't really go that much wrong with this camera either the performance is still there it is still a full frame sensor it is still very good in low light albeit you have to you know deal a bit with the focusing speed and also the skin tones but yeah otherwise a lot of the performance really ticked out a lot of the boxes and yeah especially for the age of this camera where i'm usually really skeptical and very concerned about the moiré and aliasing on this camera, it just does a really good job at omitting a lot of the moiré and aliasing. It's not completely gone, but it's still really, really good and yeah, I would say impressive even. But yeah, now onto the video side of things. Onto the video side of things, a lot of things still carries on from the photography side of things. So it still does a very good job at, you know, uh, controlling moiré and aliasing and the color tones, if you like uh, Sony color tones, uh, it will still remain that way, even though you can actually still program quite a bit in the picture style settings of course and the files from this camera is actually quite sharp full HD so I think that if you don't mind shooting full HD and also if you don't mind not having good autofocusing system this camera is still able to get the job done and to a certain extent sharp enough as well as detailed enough to be able to do it in uh, let's say paid assignment or paid um, project environment things like that so I would be definitely confident using this camera for let's say a small commercial shoot that only goes let's say on social media because you don't really need more than 1080p on social media to be honest with you and the 1080p on this camera is very good the color depth is pretty good the color rendition is also pretty good on this camera and yeah i don't really have much to complain apart from the skin tones because if you're working a lot with skin tones you might need to spend a lot of time uh, in post adjusting the skin tones of course the bit rate on here is quite um let's say low <laughs> <laughs> to put it in a very conservative way, but because of how good the files out of the camera already is I think you can be really flexible and kind of work around the limitations of what this camera has to offer So yeah, that's it for the video side of things the low light condition the low light um, scenarios, everything, it will still perform pretty nicely. And uh, yeah, as long as you know the limitations, if you know what you're doing and what you're setting on this camera, then I think you can really come out with a lot of 
amazing results for both the photography and video side of things on this camera. And now into the conclusion. Well, I think you might know by now that I really like this camera a lot, especially for the price point, I am actually gonna recommend it to a lot of you guys. Of course, as the first camera might not be so much because of the limitation of the, let's say, the skin tones and also the color science and also uh, the focusing speed because the focusing speed you can really look at other cameras, let's say even DSLRs. Um, so if you're looking into something like the D600, uh, which is still around 300 to 400 euros, or the 5D Mark III, which is around 500 euros, you're way better off with those cameras in terms of color signs, color depth, color rendition, um, skin tones as well. So yeah, if you're really into those things, then you know those cameras will be much better performer. But if you don't mind actually spending a lot of time in post, and also if you don't mind the fact that this camera has a very small battery life compared to other DSLR counterparts or even the same range of DSLR level, then, you know, this camera might be for you, but otherwise those cameras, let's say the 5D Mark III, the 6D, the D600 would be, or even the D750 would be a much better alternative for, you know, just general purpose of use because of a much faster and accurate AF, as well as not only that the color science and everything that I just mentioned, but also a much better battery life and also just a much more uh, lenses to actually mount on those DSLRs because there are so many cheaper third-party but also very good third-party lenses available for those system as well. But talking about lenses, again, using a mirrorless camera like this is really nice, especially you can actually put, well, mount even more lenses on here as well if you're kind of into, let's say, experimentation because you can even mount Leica lenses on here as well or some even older vintage uh, let's say rangefinder or even medium format uh, lenses that usually won't fit on DSLRs but will fit on here so you can actually use this as that experimentation ground. Or if you just want to have like let's say a third camera or a backup camera that is good enough in low light is more than enough to actually deliver good results albeit with the expense of um, spending time in post then yeah this camera is also a good camera because it is quite light it is quite reliable still this one card slot it might actually put a lot of people down but to be honest for the most part it is still a nice card slot that is reliable so yeah I think overall yes it might not be a true hybrid camera but if you're just kind of looking for a simple camera that does both photography and video as well as you know, having full frame and also on a super budget, then this camera is still a camera for you because it is small, it is light, and it does allow you to still enjoy using the camera despite its limitations. And it still allows you to have all the basic controls at your fingertips and makes you focus more on getting the image as well because of how kind of simple design this camera has. It doesn't throw a lot of features into your face, let's say like the a7 IV does or the, let's say the R5 in the background does. So yeah, it still allows you to really focus on your scenes, on what you're capturing. And yeah, just overall a really nice camera to just bring around. And um, you still can mount these Metabones adapters to it to still have the, the access to, let's say, some of the electronic lenses like this 85.2 although I really use it for the a7R2 because it has a much better autofocusing system than this but just be careful on what you really mount it onto but that said you still can really experiment a lot with the lenses on this camera but also talking about lenses if you're using lenses like this one, this is the 51.4 it's a Sony lens if you're using this one please do also be careful because the autofocusing system might not be that accurate to work well with that shallow depth of field. I'd say if you're using something like the f1.8 and onwards, it would still be okay. But lower than f1.8, you might have to be really still, really careful on what you shoot and what you do because it's just very thin that this camera might not find the difference. 
in the uh, focusing field. So yeah, just keep that in mind. But otherwise, yeah, I really love this camera and I know I've been repeating my points over and over again, but it's really a nice and pleasant camera to use and I would still highly recommend for any one of you to really try this camera out. And who knows, you might actually fall in love with it the way I did, of course. Back when it first came out, I didn't really enjoy using it. I didn't love it. I still love my 5D Mark III's, the 7D's and everything, but you know, Nowadays, time has changed and also using this camera has a very different purpose than when it first came out, especially for the price point as well. So it is still a nice camera to really try out. And also if you just want to experiment with the older digital look, you know, this camera has it. And uh, yeah, that's it for this video. If you need a free photography guidebook, the link is down in the description section below. I will not bombard you with any newsletter nonsense. Um, just click and download, it's absolutely for free. If you have any suggestions, any questions, feel free to leave them down in the comment section below as well. Otherwise, I thank you all very much for watching. It's been a pleasure talking to you as always. Stay safe, till next time, bye for now.